Okay, hey guys, um, I'm going to continue with part two, uh, objective 10-4, um, influence, so what influences energy needs of young children and what are those energy needs? Um, so we know that growth influences their needs, their growth velocity. So the dietary reference intakes have been developed um, and they are a comprehensive set of value reference values for nutrient intakes of healthy individuals. And we have them for males and females by different age groups, including infants. Um, they reflect slowing growth velocity of children as they move from infancy into childhood. Um, we say growth still continues throughout this time, but growth velocity slows between that infant growth spurt and then we see it pick up again during the adolescent growth spurt. So for this, we refer to the EERs, the estimated energy requirements, which can be found on your DRI table in your textbook if you have it. Um, they have these equations. Do you know how to use these equations? Um, if I give them to you on the test, or if I have a question with this on the test though, I will give you the equation, but know how to use it, okay? So we know that there's 13 to 36 months, um, and then at age three, there's there's one set of equation here, but I, at age three, um, it changes to become even more specific to the children's physical activity level. So here we use what's called PALS. PALS are the ratio of total energy expenditure to their basal energy expenditure. So how much energy they're actually outputting, putting, think of if you wear your Fitbit, if you wear a Fitbit or a similar tracker, right? You're gonna see all the stops, all the movement you take in a, in a day, your total energy expenditure compared to your basal, which is what would happen if you just sat on the couch pretty much or didn't get out of bed and did nothing. Um, and there's my plate has plans based on activity levels, which is nice because they're customized for children. Um, and then there's different pals. So for a three-year-old boy who is sedentary, the PAL is about 1,162 calories or with a sedentary pal, sorry, using the EER equation comes to about 1,162 calories per day. Um, a very active three-year-old boy would need about 1,683 um, kilocalories per day. Um, so that's how those are all calculated. Um, and um, if I did give you a question, I will, you'll know, you'll know what the PA level input should be there. Um, and then let me see what else. The RDAs, um, there's dietary reference intakes for proteins. Please know these values. Um, you could be asked these on a, on an, on, well, in this class on an exam, but also on like the RDN exam or whatnot. So for one to three year olds, the RDA is 1.1 grams per kilogram per day, which comes about 13 grams per day. And for four to eight year olds, um, the RDA is 0 0.95 grams per kilograms per day or 19 grams per day. Also, um, most toddlers and children have adequate vitamin and mineral consumption except for iron, calcium, and zinc. So we're really going to focus on these, know these values as well. And this comes from your textbook. So for ages 1 to 3, here's the iron, the zinc, and the calcium needs. And for 4 to 8-year-olds, here's the iron, the zinc, and the calcium and also be familiar with sources of iron and calcium, particularly um, for children. And then know that you don't want to take calcium and iron at the same time because of absorption interference. Uh, but pairing iron with vitamin C is a good choice because vitamin C promotes iron absorption. Um, for calcium, pairing it with vitamin D is a good choice because vitamin D is needed to absorb calcium. So um, that's all for energy and nutrient needs. And then we'll continue with um, objective 10.5. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second part recording of lecture 15, a uh, continuation from chapter 10. And we'll finish chapter 10 in this lecture. So we're going to discuss common nutrition problems. Um, 
and there's four that we're going to highlight. So first is iron deficiency anemia. This is a prevalent problem among young children in the United States. WIC centers across the country screen for iron deficiency anemia, and it's usually a part of, well, child care visits as well. Um, so why iron deficiency? Well, rapid growth. Uh, we need iron as a substrate to support our growth, plus inadequate dietary intake places toddlers, especially those at 9 to 18 month old, um, at the highest risk for iron deficiency. Um, and it's of concern because it can cause delays in cognitive development and behavioral disturbances. Um, iron deficiency anemia, how is it diagnosed? It's less than the fifth percentile of distribution of hemoglobin concentration or hematocrit in healthy reference population. So for children one to two years old, this is a hemoglobin of 11 less than 11 grams per deciliter or hematocrit less than 32.9%. And for children two to five years old, this is a hemoglobin less than 11.1 grams per deciliter and less than 33% hematocrit. So these are the markers that you can use to diagnose iron deficiency anemia and proceed from there to determine how to intervene to help correct it. Um, briefly, what is hemoglobin? It's a protein that's the oxygen-carrying component of red blood cells. A decrease in hemoglobin concentration in red blood cells is a late indicator of iron deficiency, however. So if you are seeing low hemoglobin, <coughs> iron deficiency has probably been going on for a couple of weeks. Um, hematocrit is an indicator of the proportion of whole blood occupied by red blood cells. A decrease in hematocrit is also an like indicator of iron deficiency. So really, these are our markers, our biomarkers. Um, but if we're seeing them, you know, iron deficiency has probably been going on for, <clears throat> for a while. So um, the best thing then is prevention. How do you prevent it? Um, well, first limit milk consumption to 24 ounces a day. Why? Too much milk can, first of all, displace other foods. It's very filling. Second of all, the calcium in milk actually competes with iron, preventing binding and thus in the GI tract and thus preventing its absorption. So milk can actually interfere with iron absorption. Um, so nutrition intervention can involve dietary changes. Um, iron supplements are common. Um, it's also a safe way to know, okay, my child is getting enough iron because they're be giving, being given a, a vitamin. Um, also counseling parents for dietary changes and then having repeat screenings. So here are foods that are high in iron, um, beef, pork, chicken, or turkey, fish, and clams. And then there's also non-meat sources, including fortified foods. Um, foods like eggs, a lot of young kids like cooked beans and peas are great. Oh, sorry for yawning. Great finger foods. Um, also dark leaving leafy greens and some dried fruits. Um, vitamin C actually increases iron absorption. So it's generally recommended to avoid the milk and dairy, which contains calcium. Um, when eating iron, but to include a, a food rich in vitamin C when eating iron. So these include a lot of vegetables, fruits, as well as juices. So moving on to dental caries, um, the prevalence is one in three children ages three to five get a, a dental carry, also known as a cavity. Common causes are going to bed with juice or milk. Um, sometimes a, a certain strep infection can cause dental cavities as well as sticky carbohydrate foods. Um, this can include fruits. So it is recommended that after eating fruits to, or fruit juices to wipe down teeth when possible. Um, and another good prevention is fluoride. So this could be come, come from fluoridated water, finding out if in your home uh, water is fluoridated as well as toothpaste or supplement. Supplemental amounts vary by age and fluoride content of the water supply, and it's something to be aware of. Another issue is constipation, dry, hard stools that are difficult or painful to pass. And then although concerning, it's usually temporary and can be treated. A really common cause is diet, uh, having a low fire fiber or low fluid diet. Again, if a kid is going through a food jag, if they're going in a plateau in growth and not eating as much, that could be a reason why their diet's lower in fiber or fluid. So dietary changes there could help. Some illnesses might cause constipation, resulting in an 
appetite change um, or medication side effect. Um, some children will withhold, especially if they start potty training and they're not comfortable yet going to the bathroom. And any change in routine or a stressful situation can also cause constipation. Common approaches for constipation are adequate fiber and fluid, sometimes gentle, gentle laxatives, which need to be recommended by a pediatrician such as polyethylene glycol or the brand name is Miralax. And if they don't respond well, then your pediatrician might suggest a consult with a pediatric gastroenterologist just to rule out or in another possible cause. And here's a table of an example of foods provided that are high in fiber that are good for younger children um, by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So you can view this table on your own. Um, Another common problem is elevated blood levels. And again, at wellness visits similar to iron, children will get evaluated for lead. It's seen in 1.6% of children ages 1 to 5, um, but it's here, even though the prevalence is lower, it's very serious because it can it's linked to lower IQ as well as some impaired motor behavioral and physical abilities. Um, high blood levels can decrease physical growth. Um, and it's important to reduce lead poisoning by eliminating sources of lead. There are some nutritional considerations. Uh, diet's important. Um, nutrition deficiencies like calcium and iron can actually increase lead absorption. So we want to make sure we have adequate intake of those. And um, there's also just some other sources of lead exposure. You may have heard of houses needed to be to have the lead paint removed and then repainted because paint's a major been a major source of lead, although it's much improved in recent years due to housing initiatives to get lead out of the home. Um, nutritionally, there are some imported spices um, that could be higher in lead, uh, and those are hard to test for. Some soils or dust could have higher levels of lead as well as if a, a person works in a work-related environment where they're, they have lead exposure, like construction or mining, you want to think about them coming, are they coming home? You know, where are they changing? Because if their clothes could have lead on it, those could get in the home and then the child could be exposed. And then um, food security is defined as access at all times, sufficient supply of safe, nutritious food. And it's a concern for growing children, of course, since food insecurity may hinder growth and development. Um, there are federal assistance programs, including WIC and the WIC's Farmer Market Nutrition Program that are important to be aware of um, because these provide valuable resources for food secure children and families. Food safety is also important just to be aware of. And there's this fun diagram for kids called Fight Back. It shows how washing our hands, which we're all becoming very good at right now. Um, separating foods, how to store foods properly, and how to cook to the proper temperature. Um, young children have developing immune systems, so they're especially vulnerable to foodborne illnesses. So that's something to think about. You really want to keep in mind food safety and sanitation for children, and you want to educate parents and caregivers on that too. So our dietary recommendations for children um, in the United States are all based on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015 um, to offer a variety of foods, to limit foods high in fat and sugar. Um, there's my plate is a really nice resource, you know, developed by the USDA, and there's a my plate for kids that encourages a variety of foods um, and also has useful resources um, for both information and educational materials. And here's the URL here, has fun graphic designs too that kids like. Um, physical activity recommendations are a um, guideline of at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. Kids need a lot of energy and it's really beneficial for them. Some research indicates two to five-year-olds should engage in two or more hours per day. And that can be, it doesn't need to be like running or sports. It can just be active play, like playing games in the yard, going for family walks, having freestyle dance sessions, hide and seek, ring around the rosy, Simon Says, tag, etc. cetera. Um, so the dietary guidelines in my plate focus really on lifestyle 
and are important for the prevention of childhood obesity, which we're going to talk about in our next lecture. So for children and adolescents aged 2 to 19 years old, there's the prevalence of obesity was 18.5% and affected 13.7 million children and adolescents. Uh, for two to five year olds, it was 13.9%. For the six to 11 year olds, 18.4%. Uh, and among 12 to 19 year olds, is 20.6%. We also see significant disparities. It's highest among Hispanics and non Hispanic Blacks, and also low income videos. So, for your discussion on Moodle, I posted this video. There's a URL for it, so please watch it, and then you'll answer the following discussion questions, and then that will segue us into childhood obesity. Um, and for childhood obesity, the aim is never actually weight loss um, because they're growing linearly. So our aim is always weight maintenance. The primary goal of obesity treatment is to improve long-term physical and psychosocial health through establishing permanent healthy lifestyle behaviors and changes to the environment where the child or adolescent lives. So we do not emphasize weight loss reduction for a variety of reasons. First of all, usually the growth spurt is enough to, if you address, if you can achieve weight maintenance and then have that growth spurt, um, that is usually enough to, to um, improve the children's weight to height ratio, which is what our goal is. Um, you also don't want to emphasize restriction or that there are good foods and bad foods and, and because that will derail any efforts you, a parent or caregiver has been making to promote a positive and healthful relationship with food, right? We want to think about this long term. Yes, childhood is important. Treating what's in front of us is important, but let's just think about throughout the life cycle now. We want our child to have a good relationship with food. So if they learn at this early age, which unfortunately many of us have, that food makes us fat, that food makes us unhealthy, that food makes us all these things, we shouldn't eat this, we shouldn't eat that, we should be scared of foods, we should cut out food groups. You know, all of that stuff it has just helped fuel the obesity epidemic. So um, we want to emphasize health. We want to emphasize lifestyle, physical activity, eating foods that make us feel good, that give us give our bodies good fuel, uh, and and get away from talk about weight loss in children. Um, so I know we already discussed on Zoom um, what to expect. So please check the website and this ends lecture fifteen, part two. Thank you for listening. Um, okay, so, yes. Yeah. So thank you for listening and I'm just trying to check back in the lecture. Um, so I hope you found this interesting on childhood, on toddler and preschool nutrition. This is probably my, my favorite area. Um, this in lactation, I really like, um, but part of, you know, a great thing about the course is that we get to see every area so you can find which areas you like as well. Um, and have a great, if possible, have a great break. I hope you can find some positivity in these times, even if you're out working and you're on the front line, um, you know, doing fantastic work that you're doing. Um, you know, take time for yourself, let yourself feel whatever you're feeling and let yourself be you and give yourself your space to do that. Um, but, you know, connect. We still have work to do. We still need to stay focused. You're still in school. You're still doing something amazing and finish your classes strong. Um, try not to use this tough situation as an excuse not to be the best that you deserve yourself to be for your career and for your future. Um, and if you need anything, feel free to reach out to me or other DI or other um, foods and nutrition faculty members. Um, and also the college has a lot of resources as well. All right.